everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. The topic for this week is going to be infill stations on a uh, commuter rail. Now, what is a uh, commuter rail? Commuter rail is any urban, uh, any, any urban rail system, uh, urban or suburban rail system that uses mainline tracks or historically mainline tracks, so not a dedicated subway system. Uh, and an infill stop is a stop that is being built on an existing line. So if you're doing an extension of a line, so this is the Berlin S-Bahn and U-Bahn network. The S-Bahn is much more prominent just because of how Google Earth uh, renders metro lines. So if you're expanding the system, uh, as I keep saying that Berlin should take um, the um, U-Bahn line U8, the one that runs like this, and uh, expand it, uh, and expand it uh, from its current um, terminus, which is Wittenau, toward Melkisches Viertel. This is an extension, not infill. Infill is when the line already exists, and you're building a new station on the line. Um, in Berlin, uh, there are plans to build infill um, around. The 2030 plan. Uh, the reason is that this area is seeing rapid redevelopment. Um, this was near the wall, and uh, the wall was kind of a dead zone on both sides. So a lot of near wall places are being redeveloped, uh, and and this is also very going to be very close to city center, so especially desirable. Um, but this is not very common. It is not common over here to build infill stops. Uh, however, in uh, the United States, it is extremely valuable to build infill stops on commuter rail systems. And it's at this point, I, I think that every single major American commuter rail system, and even relatively minor ones, need to have uh, plans for infill stops within the city. So to explain the situation, um, I'm zoomed in on Berlin, not because of the infill stops. Again, they exist here, but they're very uncommon. But to look at the um, situation, so an infill stop is a change. You build a new stop where there wasn't one before. So instead of looking at the change, let's look at the existing situation, the stop spacing within the city. Um, so we're zoomed in on the first S-Bahn line in Berlin, the Stadtbahn. Um, now the ring was built first. Uh, in the 18, uh, this is, I want to say 1870s, and then the Stadtbahn is late 1880s, but uh, at the time the ring was built, it was not used for urban rail, it was used as a bypass. So the urban rail really starts on the Stadtbahn, and then um, curves to the ring were for, uh, um, uh, were for return, so trains would go like this, or like this. This is because it was the steam era, and reversing a steam train is difficult. Uh, and so the Stadtbahn, let's look at the, let's, let's even pretend the Stadtbahn goes all the way from the crossing with the ring Ostkreuz to the crossing in the west Westkreuz. Um, thankfully the Stadtbahn is a little bit smaller than that, um, but in practice it's how the trains run. So this is a system, this is a very curvy line, so when I show you on the roller tool that this is about 13 kilometers, it's not quite. I mean, it's a little bit longer just because of um, just because it undulates. Um, I want to say it's about 14 kilometers. Um, so Berlin S Bahn uh, is. I didn't mean the S Bahn. I mean the Stadtbahn. The S Bahn is the entire system, including all of the branches. Uh, so this is 12, but this is not Ostkreuz to Westkreuz. This is uh, Ostbahnhof to Charlottenburg. Um, so it's 11 from Ostbahnhof to Charlottenburg. Um, because, again, because, just because, as I said, the Stadtbahn is from the 1880s, but uh, these sections are a little older. So 11 plus 2 point a bit plus from Charlottenburg. You can even see the rail yard here. Um, plus one in a bit. So I guess this is fifth, not 15, four. Yes, yes, 15. 
11 plus 2 plus 1 plus a bunch of changes is 15. So 15 kilometers, Ostkreuz to Westkreuz. And let's count how many stations there are. Um, and importantly, on the S-Bahn, every train makes every stop. So we have um, Charlottenburg, that we have Savigny Platz. Um, uh, and if you're wondering why some stations have the S and some don't, it's because the stations that are not, that don't have the S, but have that sign, are stations that have uh, additional longer range uh, trains sometimes. So this is Savigny Platz, so two. The zoo, three. Uh, Tiergarten, four. Hanseplatz, five. Uh, Hauptbahnhof, six. Uh, Friedrichstraße, seven. Hackschermarkt, you can't even find it, but it's around here. Um, did you say this seven? Did I lose count? One. Sorry if I can't count on the stream. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is Hagashamacht, nine, this is Alexanderplatz, and Janowitzbrücke, eleven, Ostbahnhof, twelve, Warschauerstraße, thirteen, Ostkreuz. So this is thirteen stops in about fifteen kilometers, so a stop every kilometer and a bit. Which is normal. This is how urban. This is normal stop. For, this is normal stop spacing for urban rail. Kilometer and a bit. I mean, the London Underground is also a kilometer and a bit. The Tokyo Metro. There's a Tokyo Subway, not just Tokyo Metro. Tokyo Subway is Tokyo Metro and Toei. That's also a kilometer and a bit. It's completely normal. Um, and uh, so this is so. So the point is that if you live near the line, you can walk to a station. Um, I live near a line. I can walk to either Janowitzbrücke or, much more commonly, to Ostbahnhof. I, that's, again, yeah, completely normalized. Now, it is normal, often, for the stop spacing to widen as you go into suburbia. Why? Because the density is lower. Now, absolute density does not impact stop spacing. This is really important. Stop spacing is an optimization of the benefit of having a stop and the disutility of having a stop for through passengers. Um, so what matters is relative density. In an area with uh, not not if the city is in general dense, but if the city but if this is a node of unusual density, you will want more stops there because many passengers go there. So the benefit of having the stop there is larger. Um, if this is a less busy area, you will want to have a uh, wider stop spacing to avoid slowing down people going to the more important nodes. So we can look at this here and see that the stop spacing is going to be a little bit wider. Um, not dramatically, but it is going to be noticeably wider. Um, on for, exa um, for example, here. Uh, on, um, so you can see that this goes a little bit farther. Um, for example, this section that I randomly picked is two kilometers between stops. Now, you can still walk if you're near the line, but it does get a little less comfortable. Um, but it's fine, because you can see the land use here. I mean, few, not a lot of people live here, right? Because this area just looks very low density and is industrial. Um, and industrial uses, you think, oh, jobs. But industrial uses aren't very job dense. Industrial uses are very land intensive. This is why they're here and not in city center. Um, and so, uh, and so the, uh, and so the intensity of use is lesser. So again, uh, wider stop spacing. That's completely normal. Um, now, the stop spacing might look a little bit different in, for example, Paris. Uh, in Paris, the way this works is that in the city, the stop spacing is very wide, um, and not intended to be walkable to every person near the line. Why? Because the RER in Paris is essentially an express bypass of the metro. The metro is much, um, so I don't think the metro is much more integrated with the RER. In many ways, it is less integrated with the RER than the U-Bahn in Berlin is with the S-Bahn. Uh, for example, there are more crossings that do not have transfers. Um, moreover, the transfer corridors are often hellishly long. Um, if you ever had to change trains at uh, Le Halle between the metro and the RER. Um, or where you used to live, Nation. But the RER is often uh, an express line 
parallel to a metro line. So um, the stops that um, the RERA makes, most of them are just express stops for the for metro line one, the busiest in the city. Um, and in, and to some extent, the RERB when it just run on stop between Le Al and Cardinal is just an express version of the of metro four, um, the second busiest in the city. So uh, so this is why we're seeing. Uh, wider stop spacing here, but the wide stop spacing continues into suburbia. Uh, so go here, and you can see that um, the stop spacing here is also pretty wide. It's um, um, so instead of a stop every kilometer and then widens to every two, it's a stop every two point something, and then it's about every almost three. Um, and uh, um, and importantly, uh, they practice transit oriented development. So. Uh, this entire brand is new. This is not a commuter line that got connected to the RER with for running. See last week's video. Uh, but um, this is this was built. So this branch opened at the same time that the running tunnel opened um, to suburbs that were being built um, at the same time. So you can kind of see how there's this kind of town center development right around with the Um And likewise, um, look here, station. Intense development, no station, forest, um, because they specifically made sure to build housing and jobs near the train in the suburbs in Paris. Um, so that's when you do things that are not uh, kilometer to two kilometers for walking distance. Uh, yeah, uh, integrating services, network design, and scheduling are not things you would look to, front, um, to the French short code examples. Sure, but um, the integration with development is better in Paris than in Germany. Germany is to an empty. Um, there's an attempt to uh, integrate development with where the trains are around Berlin, but um, I want to say it's not really happening, but the reason it's not really happening is that nobody wants to live in Bombenburg, and the result is that, um, in theory, there's supposed to be this plan to concentrate development in Bombenburg. Um, on the axes near the Berlin S-Bahn, but in practice, it's Brandenburg. Um, and so, but, but but also not, but also in general, there's not enough development in Germany. So um, there are, so you can kind of see the uh, if the intensity near the stations is higher. But compare the mid rises that we just saw on, um, on cool earth tourism in the suburbs of Paris and what we're seeing here in Berlin. That is not really a thing. If you want to see a high density concentration in the south, in it would be in, within city limits, but it would be pretty suburban. It would be Märkisches Viertel, which is not next to the S-Bahn. It is away from the S-Bahn. This was promised. Uh, they promised a, an U-Bahn connection here in the 1970s. It's been 50 years. The U-Bahn only has gotten as far as Vita now, um, and the city has just um, shall has, has just delayed plans to extend this about two kilometers into here. Um, so, yes, when it comes to DOD, France is better than Germany. Um, so now anyway, let's compare these European examples with American examples. So um, I'm going to start with what's most familiar to me, which is New York, but um, I promised then, how about uh, Japanese private rail using a lot of express types and timed over text? Um, I'm thinking about the local stops right now. Um, there are expresses um, on the RER, I'm not talking about the expresses. Um, so let's look at New York instead. Um, in New York, again, you can sort of understand some things as express bypasses of subway lines, but that's not how they're used. Um, so in New York, let's look. Uh, I might need to um, load crayon. The problem is the crayon already depicts some of the infill. So I'm just gonna need to tell you where the stops are. Um, unless I zoom in enough that Google will show me. So this is Penn Station. Next stop, there's nothing in Manhattan. There's only one stop on this. And the next stop is Woodside, which is here. There's no stop in Sunnyside right now. There are plans to build infill here, um, but it's not in existence. So Woodside. Then if you're going northeast on the Port Washington line, Port Washington branch rather, from Woodside, the next stop is the Met Stadium, so in this pretty dense part of Central Queens, there's no stop between Woodside and the Mets. Then Flushing, which is here, then 
um, there's a denser stop spacing once you're no longer near the subway. Um, and often much denser. Um, or on the main line, it goes uh, woodside, forest cells where the uh, frequency is extraordinarily low. Nearly every train skips forest cells. I believe off peak, there's only a train every hour. Kew Gardens, um, pretty close, but again, also, I think it's a train every hour, and I don't think the trains stop at both stations. Um, Jamaica, where uh, it's the main transfer point, you can see there are trains going from here and a bunch of branches, so uh, nearly all trains stop there. Um, and yes, New York has quite a lot of places that need infill, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah, so then you said it's only for some lines. I mean, as I said, I mean, I'm considering a station to exist if some trains stop there. I'm only highlighting if it's something that barely exists, like only a train every hour, because that is kind of the main. Um, the local, like Paris has a mixture of local and express trains on the RER, but the locals run every 15 minutes on the RERB. Um, and sometimes there's an overlay with another 15 minutes local and then another 15 minute express. So it's not a train every hour, that would be ridiculous on, on an urban rail system. A, a train every hour is if you're connecting two faraway cities. Um, and the thing is, past Jamaica, there's more stops, um, but again, not that many within the city. And then suddenly when you leave the city, the stop spacing tightens. So you can see Jamaica, um, Hollis, and this is even not, not even about being expressed to the subway. The subway stops running around here uh, um, at uh, Parsons, uh, not Parsons. Yes, Parsons, it's at Parsons Archer. There's a subway that goes a little bit farther here. So Jamaica, long nonstop to Hollis, long nonstop to Queens Village. I mean, when you say long, let's, I mean, let's quantify how long is long, right? Um, so from Queens Village to Jamaica, it's 6.4, six and a half kilometers of two stops. Um, and remember that in Berlin, um, in the suburban parts of Berlin, and this is a suburban part of New York, albeit a denser one than the suburban parts of Berlin, it's um, not four kilometers for two stops, it's six and a half. But then once we leave the city, look, it tightens suddenly. Um, so uh, suddenly you, um, we're getting uh, many more stops. Uh, Bell Road, we're getting Floral Park, um, the stops on the way to uh, Mineola and Hicksville. Um, so, so the stop spacing is somehow tighter in the suburbs than in the city. Why? Because the purpose of American commuter rail is not to serve the city, it is to serve the suburbs. If there's urban service, um, it's an afterthought. Uh, and that is pretty common. Uh, so, so again, in New York, it's not the cleanest example, it's just the one I'm most familiar with. Now, I promised um, Ben that I'm going to do Philadelphia, so let's do Philadelphia. Um, in Philadelphia, we will see the exact same thing. Oh, Hollis is an employee-only stop? Oh, so it's actually non-stop Jamaica to, oh shit, 6.4, kil uh, six and a half kilometers, Jamaica to Queens Village non-stop? It's, oh my god. Yeah, exactly. There's no subway service. And we're, and we're going to talk about what it would take to make the infill stops a success rather than just something that exists. And this is where I'm going to have to talk about my least favorite city that I'm very familiar with, Boston. Um, so in Philly, uh, there's a rapid succession of three city center stops. Who are in literal center city, Market East, and Suburban Station, uh, respectively. The underground replacement for the Reading Terminal, this one, before they built the Thru Tunnel, and Suburban Station is the uh, old um, terminal for the PRR before they punched the tunnel east of it. Uh, and the Intercity Station, 30th Street Station, which is right across the river from, city, um, from Center City, and there's already commercial development there. It's uh, right next to city center. Um, it is very well served by uh, rail just because the subway uh, goes there. The um, I, I think it's not called the subway. I guess in Philadelphia there are two lines in the north. This is the subway. This is, here it's the subway, but it goes above ground outside. So, the, so they call this line the L. So there's the L, commuter rail, um, and there's even Amtrak for um, for your or your business trips to New York and Washington. And so um, this area is seeing redevelopment. Um, and in one direction, there's a closely spaced neighborhood stop 
where there's also development. This is a university city uh, for a uh, service to um, Yupan. Uh, but for the most part, the stop spacing within the um, city then widens dramatically. So look at all of this non-stop stuff. Um, and this is also an active, uh, and not this, but this is an active line. So Eastwick, University City, and it just non-stops here. Um, if you want, if you live in West Philly, then you ride the tramway. Um, you can kind of see the black here. The black here is not the subway. It's a streetcar that then goes into um, a so into a trolley tunnel called the subway surface line. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it, so it's a very so so it's a very good uh, so so it's a very good location for redevelopment. I um I I am also very happy to see this kind of job growth uh, in near downtown areas. Um, because usually um, a, a big difference between America and Europe is that um, in Europe, when jobs are not literal city center, they grow into neighborhoods that are near city center. So the example would be a place like University City um, or in New York, Long Island City or in Boston, um, Kendall Square or the Seaport. And uh, in the United States, this happens like the examples I just mentioned, but it's much more common, including sadly in Philadelphia, to just skip the urban area entirely and go to a suburban edge city, um, so, so very auto-oriented. In this case, it's king of Prussia. Um, and Philadelphia, unfortunately, has unusual uh, levels of job sprawl for such an old, um, uh, for, for such an old, large urban core, much more so than uh, Boston, uh, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but at any rate, note that if you're, if you live in West Philly, you don't, you got to ride the regional rail, the up the regional rail, not here. Um, you got to ride the trolley. Uh, and uh, likewise, in this part, um, it's the same thing. Um, there's, the, so the yellow line is the, is the city limits, and there are commuter rail stops. There are, there are separate regional rail stops here, but at the very edge, within the built up Part of the of the city, there are no stops. Um, what do you do if you need public transport? Um, you ride a trolley again, maybe a bus. Um, these trolleys are not especially fast. Um, now, Borners is asking: This is because the infill station would serve those people? Uh, yes, exactly. Now. Um, well, so for people who are so Ben, um, I'm, if I'm saying something that's wrong, let me know in comments. Um, so Philadelphia um, is a is not a city that is extremely wealthy right now, like New York or Boston or Washington or San Francisco. This means that it has less; it's had less immigration in the last few decades. Um, so racially, a place like New York or even Chicago has a lot of people who are neither white nor black, but descended from more recent immigration. Philadelphia does not have as much of that. Philadelphia remains very black and white. Um, and, um, and it has the kind of stereotypical Rust Belt pattern of poor city rich suburbs. Um, and the poor urban neighborhoods are largely black because the white working class has suburbanized to a large extent, not entirely South Philly. It's kind of a historical white working class uh, area um, that's, I think, getting richer because city jobs access and the, the poor people fully suburbanized. Um, but um, the um, but there's a lot of black poverty in North Philadelphia um, and in West Philadelphia. Uh, and if you are about my age uh, and you grew up on Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Uh, you remember the tune West Philadelphia Born and Raised. That is like the entire thing is that Will is that the Will Smith character and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air grew up in that kind of poverty and is um, suddenly exposed to the extreme black wealth of Bel Air. Um, and um, when I visited um, the area, I crashed. Um, I'm forgetting where in West in in 
West Philly slash University City, maybe around here, and they would take either the L or the um, trolley to City Center. I would um, go to the bookstore and read. Um, and uh, what I noticed is that off the um, on the trolley, I was the only white person um, in the car. So it was not an empty train. Um, it might have been two in the afternoon um, or four in the afternoon. And if I uh, and so the car would be, let's say, or the trolley would be about twenty-five people. Um, usually, I was the only white person. I think once it was one other white person. So again, very racially segregated, and. The demographics of regional rail are very different, and there is very toxic city suburb relation. Something that I know it's a big thing in New York, and I believe it's also a thing in Philadelphia, where um, there's a lot of hostility to the idea of making commuter rail useful for city residents because of suburban um, hate of the city. Um, but but notice just a, like the technical level, not explaining the racial dynamics leading to this, but just explaining the situation, the, the train situation is that. You have all this, we have, there's this long non-stop sideline, and then as soon as you hit the suburbs, it's the, the stops are very closely spaced. Um, often the situation is that every um, municipality wants its stop, um, and you know that these are different municipalities. This is um, very fragmented um, northeastern suburban municipalities. Um, I'm going to pretend to start here and not here, just for the just because I'm going to do a straight line. Um, I'm going to pretend it covers the curve, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Six stops in seven kilometers, seven stops in a little more than eight. That's the stop spacing that Berlin has in the urban core. And in Philadelphia, it's exactly the opposite. It is only in the suburbs. Now, these are inner suburbs. This is, so this is called the main line. Um, this is not the same. So let me explain what it means. Main line. Um, there's something called the septa main line, which is uh, so. This is the PRR side of the system. The there's something called the septa main line on the rutting side of the system, um, just because more branches use this segment, whereas here some split and go here. Um, this was this is the main line of uh, the historic Pennsylvania Railroad from Philly to Pittsburgh and Point West. So that's why this area is called Main Line. This is a very uh, wealthy suburban area. Uh, and um, then this, uh, so but passing through West Philly poverty, it just goes on top. Likewise here, going through North Philly poverty, it's not going on top. There are stops here. There's a stop at Temple. There's a stop that in last video I called North Philadelphia it is incorrect. The PRR stop here to Trenton is called North Philadelphia. This stop is at Almost the same location. There's no connection between them, but it's called North Broad. Um, but again, the neighborhood is called North Philly. And uh, so not a lot of stops. And then eventually, in the very outer parts of the city, there's uh, a narrower stop spacing. Sadly, because it's within the city, it's still not very useful for urban residents. And ridership on the in-city lines, like, Chest like the Chestnut Hill lines, uh, is not very high. Uh, Oh, hi, thanks, Maraki. Exactly, exactly. Um, main lines for PR side are the Keystone and Northeast Carter. Yes, but there, when you say main line, um, it's like a general description in the Philly area, you mean the uh, PR main line. Um, and yeah, um, oh, okay, okay. Um, so, sure, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so the fact that immigrants don't settle in rail surf neighborhoods, um, that's a Philadelphia thing. Um, in New York, uh, immigrants, so, so what are the main immigrant groups in New York? I mean, the answer is all of them, but, um, uh, and, and I'm going to get it wrong because I don't always know which immigrant groups are the most numerous among people in the last, last let's say, 20 or 30 years. But for example, the Dominicans um, are rooted in places like Washington Heights, um, so on the A train. Um, West Harlem, also on the, uh, maybe not the A train, that would be the one train. Um, various parts in the Bronx on the subway. Uh, I think there's a lot of Dominicans nowadays on, in Hell's Kitchen, so not really on the subway, but walking distance to Midtown. Uh, Chinese immigrants uh, are in a bunch of neighborhoods and they're all on the subway. 
Um, generally in New York, um, you only move to a non-subway neighborhood once you can afford a car. Um, th there isn't a lot of people being pushed out actually past subway range. It's more people being pushed out to kind of bullshit bus to subway vaguely, um, or usually just out of the region entirely. Um, and yes, college students don't really ride the regional rail, um, even though, again, it does serve them. There is a temple. There's a stop at temple. But um, if you're a college student, why would you take a train that is designed to deliver you at rush hour to Center City? You don't work at Center City. You're a student at Temple. Um, maybe you want to go to something at Drexel or UPenn around here. Then uh, what would you do? Then what, then what would you do? You would go to uh, sleep with someone that you met who goes to that uni. Um, that's not a rush hour trip. Um, maybe you're going to go to a seminar. Um, maybe you're going to go um, to a lecture. Uh, I don't know to what extent they do um, um, the two cross-day classes. Um, I imagine they wouldn't because Penn feels snooty toward everything else. But um, but sometimes they do let you cross-day classes. I know it's a Massachusetts thing. It's maybe they... Um, uh, um, maybe they're going to let you uh, do Harvard MIT, um, both on the red line. Um, but again, seminars. Um, uh, that's a much less nutty thing. And, uh, but these are not generally rush hour trips. And, uh, and so commuter rail doesn't serve them very well because commuter rail has very poor frequency of peak. Um, I know that uh, Bryn Mawr has, so it's actually everything about it, Bryn Mawr, uh, Let's you cross state classes. Uh, you get cheap to free parking classes from the university, but students don't generally own cars. Not in general. I mean, at Brown, so Providence, so um, much less transit oriented than, than Philly. Very few grad students have cars. Um, and I, as a postdoc, didn't, which was not universal, but was a thing that a bunch of postdocs did. Um, Brandon Mar lets you, uh, anyway, cross state classes at, I believe, Penn. Um, so the main line would be ideal for that if it ran better frequency. The, the main line does serve Brandon Mar, um, but the frequency might not be very good. Um, and um, in Boston, it's the same thing. In Boston, it's, uh, it's the same thing. A women's college and, and a uh, historic men's college, now co ed uni, that it was. Historically, fairly rich in uh, Boston, we Wellesley and MIT. Um, so you can't talk about infill stops without mentioning Boston because Boston has actually done this. Um, so in Boston, we do see long segments with no infill. Um, for example, on the Providence line, um, there is a segment. Uh, so there's a South Station. How about I'm sure you? So the problem is this will show you all the, um, th so this is, please ignore, how, um, so the thing is this will show you a timetable and the timetable is at this point dead. Like don't look at the numbers, please. The numbers are, um, again, bypass, like look at the numbers from the transit matters, uh, from the transit matters regional rail, regional rail dot net, that's the address. Uh, look at the timetable that we post there. Um, but um, it's a good illustration for the most. I'm just going to tell you where there's infill. So here, I didn't draw any infill. So South Station, Back Bay, Ruggles. Ruggles is on the edge of city center. Boston has a second downtown in Back Bay. Um, that's not even recent redevelopment like Kendall or the Seaport. This is pretty old. Um, and, this, and Ruggles is kind of an extension of that. This is the Longwood Medical Area. Um, and then beyond that, um, I'm drawing Forest Hills as a stop. Um, and then Hyde Park, and then Reedville, and even this is a pretty wide stop spacing. This is four kilometers, and this is five. But even this is somewhat of an infill. Um, no train that runs on the on the purple line as a direct stops at Forest Hills. Forest Hills right now is only a stop on the trains that go on this branch, which I'm not even depicting on the map because I think it should be reduced to an orange line extension. The orange line subway um, runs parallel here. Um, and
And uh, so right now, in practice, on all the third trains, it goes Ruggles, direct to Hyde Park, and a lot of trains skip Hyde Park. Um, Reedville, but Reedville is only for trains that branch out to Franklin, not continuing in Pro and to, toward Providence. And, and again, you can see the pattern where there's a long stop spacing here, and then a shorter one in suburbia. Um, now, uh, this is the Worcester line, and I'm depicting more stops. A lot of them are infill. So, uh, Heinz is infill. Not sure it's constructible at this spot. Fenway Park exists. It is called uh, Lansdowne. BU infill, West Station, infill that is actually being built. Boston Landing infill that recently opened. Fennel doesn't exist. It used to exist and then it closed. Um, Newton Corner, same thing. In general, by the way, um, a lot of the infill stops um, in, the, in these cases that I'm talking about, it's not that the line never had these stops. Often they historically had these stops, and then they were very poorly served. For example, the frequency was very weak, or the stairs were much higher than the stairs um, on uh, uh, non-commuter rail uh, transit, like um, streetcars, the subway, buses. Uh, in New York, you would think that um, peak ridership on commuter rail might have been recent because of um, post-war sprawl. For example, Metro North. Um, I believe Metro North was on the eve of Corona at its ridership. Um, uh, but the LIRR was not. The LIRR never quite recovered. I think it was pretty close to Corona, but it never quite recovered to its ridership peak in the 1920s when this section word flushing had many um, stops named after these various neighborhoods. For example, Winfield Junction was around here. Um, and um, the um, and these stops, I think, charged 25 or 30 cents per ride, and people who lived there used them as the area was redeveloping, developing the first line. And then this line was built, the 7 train. It was not called the 7 train, it was called the, the Corona line and the flushing line, but it's the 7 train. And then the 7 train offered a train every couple minutes, all day, every day, not just mostly rush hour service. The fare was $0.05. Cents. Um, and uh, early on, I don't think this this line ever maybe ever paid for itself, but the um, subway was profitable um, operationally when it opened. And uh, I think also in the 1920s, um, it was... Holding up in the inflation, it was kind of difficult because inflation because the fare cap stayed the fare stayed at five cents. It really should have been increased to ten after post World War One inflation. Um, but also the city was wealthier and ridership was booming in the twenties. Um, so, so this line was not a financial drain or anything. Um, but five cents, twenty five cents, or thirty cents, um, and a train every few minutes, a few trains per day. So then these stops were decimated, and then they were closed. Um, and so, so the, um, and then with post-war suburbanization, suddenly there was a lot of ridership here, um, motivating keeping the stops in the suburbs, and then expressing or mostly expressing through the city. Um, and then this um, involved white flight and um, racialized the um, suburban hate for the city. Um, now. There is an example of infill stops, and this is the Fairmount line. Now, the Fairmount line here is depicted with its current stops. Um, all of these stops exist. Um, in fact, the Transit Matters uh, plan even suggests um, a potential location for an infill um, around here. Um, and likewise, the possibility of um, infill around uh, here between Farsdale and Hyde Park. Ourselves in that part, um, but it's not in the timetables or anything. Uh, it's just a possibility. Um, this is mostly recent infill. Um, so this is between so from South Station, it's one, two, three, four, it's Talbot, five, West Conha, um, six. It's called Matt. I'm calling it Mattapan, but it's Blue Hill Ave. Seven, eight stops, and it used to be half of that many. And um, it was there's they've built a bunch of infill stops. I believe five of them, um, like the um, and again I'm, I'm giving them slightly different names, uh, mostly because I try to name them after neighborhoods and not um, streets, especially um, for compatibility with urban rail. So 
I'm so on this map, um, this stop which again is exists and called Blue Hill Avenue. I'm calling it Matapan, um, just for compatibility with the possibility of light rail on Blue Hill Ave. Uh, and then this stop is the one that's actually called Matapan, and I'm calling it Southern Matapan. Um, but again, naming aside, um, yeah, so as you're mentioning, Brock, Fairmont is a, I think you were incorrect when you're saying Fairmont is a good example of infilling. Um, it is a decent example. Um, I don't want to call it a half measure. It might be a quarter measure. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, the, and Ben, I will talk about the paralleling subway in a sec. Um, but here, what they've done is they've uh, they've done two things. So they've opened all these infill stops, um, and they've built them to pretty high standards. For example, high platforms. Um, in general, all the new builds, all the new platform builds in the Boston area are high platforms. Um, it's just the legacy stations that remain largely low platform, maybe low platform with a one car, uh, um, with a one one car long, uh, uh, high platform just for people in wheelchairs, but everyone else boards low platform, and so it's very slow to board. Um, but the frequency, uh, and they've also reduced the fares, so the fares are still not integrated, and this means um, if you ride the subway. Um, the fares are a little higher than the bus, which is stupid. They should raise bus fares to meet subway fares in Boston. But if you uh, uh, connect from the bus to the subway, you only pay the fare difference. So, just, so you pay as if it's just a subway trip. If you connect from the subway to the bus, you don't pay extra for the bus. In co um, so what they've done is commuter rail is generally much more expensive, even in the same place. Because, again, there's um, different history. It was never integrated. And then with white flight, it... Uh, class size and racialized. Um, and uh, the, um, but on top of that, they don't, you, you have to pay extra at separate tickets. Now what they did on the Fairmount line is it's still separate tickets, but it's, but um, I believe all stops except Fairmount and Reedville uh, are, or, or maybe with Fairmount but without Reedville are in the same, or they charge subway fare. So if you ride between this stop, which again is not actually called Matapan, it's called Blue Hill Ave, in South Station, you pay the same fare as if you rode the subway. The only uh, difference is that if you ride the subway and change to another subway line, you pay one fare. If you ride commuter rail and then change to the subway, you pay two fares. And it's especially important because a lot of people in Boston use the subway to sorry, use the buses to connect with the subway. Boston has very good bus subway integration. Um, so it's that for a city without a particularly impressive model split, the um, rail ridership per capita um, is okay-ish um, for, for a very peaky American system uh, just because the people don't ride the bus exclusively. Maybe if people ride the bus, it's usually to connect or a train. Uh, and so the uh, and, and so the system is that there, there's no fair integration. There's some, and it helps. Uh, but there's no full fare integration. Uh, the frequency is especially terrible. The trains run every 45 minutes. Um, they recently came with uh, came up with uh, uh, more regular clock face timetables, uh, offering hourly clock face service um, on most lines, uh, and I think half hourly on a line uh, that they literally named the environmental justice corridor. This one called the Eastern. Um, here I'm depicting a lot of info. Um, and uh, so uh, Fairmount is an in-city line. It serves the most urban, shortest range trips. They would expect it to have the highest frequency, but no, it's trained every 45 minutes. They bullshit it that uh, they can't do any better because of something, something midday maintenance, aka they just never bothered um, doing frequent service and they don't feel like bothering uh, doing it so that um, they can run a train every 15 minutes or 20 minutes on this line. Um, so the frequency doesn't work. Their, the integration with the buses is not a cliff, but they did cut the fares and they did build the infill stops and they did heavily market it and the outcome was that ridership tripled. Now this is still the week, the, the lowest ridership line and this is a bit, I think at one point it was not just lowest ridership but also lowest ridership per kilometer which is impressive for how urban it is. And now it's the lowest ridership because it's the shortest, but 
it's an, I think it's in the middle of the pack in ridership per kilometer, and this is on a system where the uh, frequency and many other things repel urban riders. So this is why I'm saying that it is not a good example of infilling. It is a decent one. Um, so to infill, and, and, and the reason that these um, many of these historic stops exiled, um is that the service was bad. So you need to make sure to have good service and also infill. And this is something that I mentioned right at the beginning um, when I um, brought up that in uh, Berlin, this is not actual infill. This is stops that always existed. And Hulu is pointing out that if you upgrade a regional line to S-Bahn status, that is to say useful urban commuter rail, um, often it means higher frequency. Um, fair integration, I mean, at this point, everything is fair integrated, but um, uh, schedule integration um, uh, with um, more local trains. Maybe they're going to move um, the buses to serve that better. Um, and maybe they're going to redo the timetable so that there's going to be some kind of time connection if it's possible. Um, and then if it's more useful, then yeah, you will add more stops because a, useful, a more useful line will have more ridership. Um, in these areas. Um, uh, so now Ben previously linked to this plan, which I, one of these days I will remember that because of something they can't quite tell with OBS, they can stream from it, but, I, but the chat client doesn't recognize that it's me, so I can't post. You see, it, uh, it, prom it prompts me for a login. So um, instead, if I want to um, say anything in chat, I need to say here. Uh, you can't see me, I guess, under the... Uh, might as well material guys for a sec. Yeah, you, you can see the right part of, uh, the, of the text box. Um, but anyway, so this is... So there are a bunch of plans in Philadelphia to improve things. Um, at this point, I think the two cities that are most interested in reforming are Philadelphia and Boston in the United States. New York, let's not talk about it. Chicago, let's not talk about it. San Francisco, let's definitely not talk about it. Los Angeles, even less. Um, so in Philadelphia, there are plans, and uh, I know that um, Ben was involved in advocating for them. I don't, I don't, I don't, Ben. I don't think you were involved in the actual plan, right? It was uh, um, that was a the, the, that's Christoph Spieler um, who's um, involved in that plan. But I know that you at in Fifth Square have been pushing for this a lot, and likewise at Boston. Uh, no, I, I know that there's no plan yet. I'm saying that um, the but my understanding is that there's um, is that the city or SEPTA did actually hire. Christoph to make a suggestion at least, to make to make suggestions at least, um, and these include modernization of commuter rail, um, things that Philadelphia should have done and almost did in the 1970s under Vukan Vucic, um, who even gave the lines names as if they were S bond. Was instead of S, um, it was R. So there were lines with names like R1 through um, R8, and uh, this was supposed to imitate German s bonds and these lines were supposed to run every 10 minutes. Instead, they're running hourly off-peak. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's not about infill stops, but it's it's about redoing the timetables to have more off-peak frequency, okay. Um, are they doing anything about fares in Philly? They are, right? They, they are trying to make sure that um, everything within Philly paid subway fare, right? Um, in Boston, the fares... Again, they're not quite there, but they're very close. Oh, that sucks. That info is de emphasize. In Boston, we're proposing. There's a little bit of info. Um, we're proposing a bunch on the Eastern Line, the one that they rebranded as the Environmental Justice Corridor, which is the worst name I can think of. Mm. The, um, but but anyway, so Philadelphia needs. Uh, info, I think, and especially if service improves, as in the plan. So that would be um, making sure that instead of a line every hour, and so to a place like Chestnut, the, the Chestnut Hill, uh, the Chestnut Hill lines east and west, the trains are not, uh, the trains are very infrequent, and and they charge, and I believe they still charge extra, 
Um, so the buses that are parallel to them are very busy. And instead, um, and, by, and by the way, I'm not saying anything that Ben does not know. I'm just saying it on stream. Um, and so maybe we rejiggering them so that the buses would serve the commuter trains and the commuter trains should run very frequently and charge the same fares uh, as urban rail, that would relieve pressure on the buses maybe and also fill um, trains and fill a railroad that's not very full. Uh, much more efficient this way. Um, when you move passengers from bus to train. Oh, God. Yeah, okay, so universal employer subsidized passes run into the problem, which is that um, a lot of poor people don't have access to that benefit. Um, if you work for a but if you work for a bodega, you don't ever get that. So this is the problem when you're trying to um, outsource the state to employers. Um, and um, and it gets to the point that um, in for example in Japan a lot of the state is outsourced to employers, and even though the place is pretty aggressively MB, um, the benefit system is so employer based that um, if you for example if you're self employed. Um, a lot of landlords will not even want to run to you. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. This is just, yeah, just run universal services. Like, I, mean, I, I rag on the Nordic countries all the time, but that part they do right. Um, yeah, New York is not doing what Philly and Boston are. I need, I don't think doing, but I should say glancing at doing. Um, yeah, north-south rail link in Boston, but I mean, bear in mind, north-south rail link is several billion dollars, and basically every other uh, commuter rail modernization intervention in Boston combined would be about the same. So, it'd be electrifying everything, high platforms everywhere, and fill stop, um, doing a little bit of multi-tracking for more capacity, replacing the entire rolling stock, redoing the switches um, on the approach that the trains can run. Um, it can enter South Station at more than 10 miles an hour. Um, and so um, the infill is just much easier. So in Boston, again, we're, so we're proposing infill. So, so the actual stations that exist are, um, and it's where I'm constantly telling people not to rely on this old, on this older map. Um, they go North Station, Chelsea, um, River Worth, which is barely served um, just for a GE plant, and then LEN, and then the suburban stop. And what we're proposing is um, Sullivan, just for the connection, Everett. Uh, I'm, this is a plan that I, this timetable that I wrote, that I signed my name to, that I still don't remember if we're doing one reviewer stop or two reviewer stops. This is two reviewer stops. I think we're doing two. I think we're proposing two. Um, full time stop at Riverwork, Lynn, Swamp Scott. And there's also something that's not a big one that's not the proposing, which is a stop around here called South Salem. Um, which comes from the fact that the actual Salem stop is not here. This is a single track tunnel, but the actual Salem stop is here. So then there's South Salem in our proposal here. Essentially, it's a place for trains to wait out the single track, um, which is much better than. Doubling the tunnel for, I think they're saying it's 180 billion, not billion, 180 million dollars. They really don't understand. Um, and also, there's stuff here. So, I got a bunch of infill um, as part of what we're proposing. Um, here, it's not something we're, I mean, we're proposing Newton Corner, but um, uh, again, Boston Landing exists. West Station is to be built. The others might be too difficult. Uh, yeah, New York is just wasting a lot of things. So, um, so Ben, you were mentioning that in the Bronx, um, commuter train, uh, commuter trains serve subway deserts, and uh, it's different from uh, the Express Seven model for the Port Washington branch. True, and yet Seven is extremely crowded, and so it's valuable to shift passengers from uh, small trains to big train to big boy trains. Um, Especially when the big boy trains are all very crowded. I and mean, people on the LRR keep complaining that the trains are full. No, they're not full. Um, an average LRR train enters in before Corona, entered Penn Station with about, at about 80% seated capacity. And in Boston, it's even codified. 
a commuter train in Boston is considered to be at capacity if 80% of the seats are filled because the seats um, are two and three in uh, New York, in, in most of the trains in the suburbs of New York and Boston, and all the ones in Boston. So um, nobody likes the middle seat, so the middle seat is viewed as kind of overflow of the train is above capacity. Um, on the subway, in New York at least, what is deemed to be capacity is, I believe, about three times seated capacity, maybe three and a half times seated capacity. Uh, again, it's very unequal, and I'm pointing out the class, the classized and the racialized aspect of it, because a lot of it is just, divert, it's just rich people who feel more important, and then when you don't treat them like they're more important, Three of them throw a tram, uh, throw not tram, three of them throw a tantrum, and then they just adapt to it, and ridership is much higher because it's a universal service. Um, yeah, exactly. So you do, you definitely want to relieve the staff. Um, even more so, you want to. Um, I don't think you should infill here. Like I'm actually okay with there being no stop between Woodside and Forest Hills. Maybe I don't even know if there should be some kind of infill. It's a kind of weird Winfield junction around here for um, IBX, maybe. Um, but the E exists and makes stops about like this. So it's okay to be a little more express. But um, it's obligatory to have better urban service. And this means uh, same fare as the subway. Fare integration, which means that you can switch. It just means you can switch between the subway and the buses at no cost. Um, you should be able to switch between the subway or a bus and commuter rail at no cost. Um, and again, metro card fare within the city, um, or I guess omni fare within the city at this point. Um, very high frequency. I don't even hear want to hear about train every hour or even every half hour to these places. It's very much in every ten minutes or get the fuck out. Ideally, every five. Um, these are pretty close places. The current timetable. It's pretty slow because there's somewhat of a gratuitous slowdown in the Penn Station throw that can be checked. But it's at the end of the day, 15 kilometers. Um, without a lot of stops, it should be 15 minutes to the city. Maybe even less. Um, to city center, rather. But, um, and so the trains should run every 10 or 15. Not even 15. Every 10 minutes, as I said. Um, and every five should be looked at. I think. Um, and yeah, it means that the train's going to be very full with many standees going all the way to Jamaica, maybe, or even to Eastern Queens, and that's fine. And that's fine because, um, yeah, people are going to stand 20, 25 minutes. They do it on the E train already. They do it on, um, they do it on the four or five trains, they do it on the two or three trains. Um, and then if they go right inbound and they just get seats here, and yeah, people here stand. And outbound, uh, some people sit, some people stand. But okay, maybe on your way back home to your white flight suburb, you have to stand 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and then you get a seat. And that's fine. Again, as I said, three people will throw a tantrum. These people are going to move to Florida anyway. And everyone else will just adapt. And universal services, again, they work better. And, um, and this also cascades to... Doing to doing better service on the more urban lines, um, so that would be so. In the same way that the Fairmount line needs a lot of frequency, um, things like the Hampstead branch, uh, which is this one, um, needs more frequency. Um, this is the suburbs, but this is inner suburbs. So I can vaguely see an argument for a train every fifteen minutes here, maybe every twenty off peak early, maybe, maybe. And then the inter and then this this is not this is not should not be infill. This should be there's literally an extension on it. This is line. There's a fair number of jobs there. Um and then twenty twenty ten, I can vaguely see. Although it could be ten, ten. Arguably. Um, especially with much with future build out five, five, two and a half. Um and and again, maybe the far rock away and Long Beach line, which is actually nice because then it's freq okay frequency, okay frequency, and on the merge part of it, very good frequency. Um, this is really important, and this needs to come again. Um, integrated fares, uh, 
high frequency integrated schedule so that the buses don't compete with the trains they feed them. Um, so, so instead of separate, so instead of apartheid transit, which is um, the nice buses, not just the name of the system, which is the nice buses to the suburbs um, for poor people and then trains for rich suburban commuters, um, the average income of transit commuters in these suburbs is extremely high, much higher than for everyone else, because again, white flighters are working in the city. Um, and then, um, uh, and, and then once you, and, and then once everything falls into place, infill just becomes very useful. Um, yeah, also up zoning, but the thing is, even at present day zoning, there is a lot of demand for Manhattan bound travel from this part. I mean, there's a reason the E train is severely overcrowded at rush hour. Um, and that is, there's a lot of demand here, and the commuter trains don't serve it. The E-train does. Um, and there's a reason why the buses here are very crowded at rush hour. There's, there's kind of bullshit kind of rush route system where the buses are very peaky, uh, which is not very efficient. Um, should run better off-peak frequency on these buses. Um, and um, the thing is, once you run, and, and, and as I said, integration with buses, not just in the suburbs, also in the city. So um, one of the problems that they ran into with the Queen's bus redesign is that, um, let, let me see if I can find, um, wait, thanks, uh, are there reasonable options for achieving decent s band frequency if there aren't multiple branches? Yeah, you just run individual branches uh, frequently, I mean, like, Running all the way to, I mean, Hempstead is a pretty dense suburb. Um, yeah, you can do short turns, turns but at a place like Hempstead or, or Port, Port Washington is not a branch. I mean, call it a branch, but um, it branches out here. And the thing is, the entire line um, deserves high frequency just because here it's pretty dense. And yeah, here it's less dense. So, okay, run every 10 minutes here, um, 20 here, or honestly, there's an argument for five. Um and um, then just relieve the seven that way. This is really useful. Um, and uh, and again, it's useful to do more infill. So, for example, the, the thing that I keep plugging that New York should be doing is infill that, that I call sunny that I call Sunnyside Junction. This is the junction between the Northeast Corridor and the LIRR. And the thing is that it's also the reverse junction from uh, trains to Penn Station and soon to open trains to um, Grand Central. Um, which go around here. Um, so building that is a, um, so there's room for the most part to build platforms that let passengers transfer across platform. One direction is trivial, one requires a little bit of work. And um, so they should open this station uh, and then it's walkable. And, and then if, especially if they do some basic sprawl repair, it's walkable from sunny side, um, walkable a little bit from, um, um, from here. Um, there are also some plans to do an infill here, as I found, um, which is already just on the Penn Station side, but that's, especially again, if they put good sidewalks on this, uh, on Queens Boulevard, then that's walkable to jobs around Queensboro Plaza, and this is a pretty big job center. Like, this is in the near tie, depending on uh, weirdnesses in the job reporting system in near tie with downtown Brooklyn for the biggest job center outside Manhattan in the New York region. Um, and yeah, this is a very busy rail junction complex. Um, anyway, I was talking before about the buses in Queens, so I'm going to not do this, and I'm instead going to remember that I actually have this on my computer, and then you can see it in between the... Uh, Um, of, so this is the current thing. So where's the Queen's bus redesign? Maybe it would be in downloads. Where is that? So it's this one, and what I'm going to try doing is saying the, uh, and instead of downloading it, I'm just going to 
P.S. This makes me angry. Google Translate. I guess works for English Spanish, but please don't rely on it for non-European languages. It's terrible for Hebrew. Um, it's okay for Chinese, but I don't think it's very good for Chinese. So, um, anyway, so this is the map. And you might be able to notice that um, even at this zoom level, you can see that a lot of the routes are still funneling into Flushing and Jamaica. Instead of trying to run as grids in eastern Queens, um, there, are, there are a few routes to do that, but a lot of them just funnel like this route. It doesn't go, it goes like this to Jamaica. Um, and, uh, and, and the reason is that the subway uh, only goes as far as Jamaica and Flushing. Beyond that, you have commuter rail. And now if commuter rail were actually useful as urban rail, that is to say minimum a train every 10 minutes, think about a train every seven and a half or a train every five, um, then the buses would not need to go like this or like this. They could go like this and then with a good connection into place like Bayside um, or, um, uh, or Broadway, which is a very weird name for a stop that is at uh, Northern uh, Boulevard. Uh, it's called Broadway Flushing. I may, I, maybe the street was called Broadway before, but it's not called. But it's on Broadway now, so please. Um, and likewise, stops to uh, stops that don't exist here but can oh, and should open um, could be bus connection points, and that makes things a lot more efficient than making everything uh, go through the congested morass of Jamaica or Flushing. Um, you were distracted by news about Trump. Um, okay, I mean, I'm at this point a lot less concerned about Trump and a lot more concerned about people who are actually in power. Um, you know, Biden, Charles, Macron, Putin, Clarence Thomas. Um, anyway, so, uh, catch up on the walls, huh? Uh, anyway, so this becomes very important. Again, these stops, if you just open them and don't do anything else, they aren't going to get a lot of ridership because, okay, let's say that Elmhurst, they open a, an infill stop at Elmhurst. There are plans to do that. Okay, you have open an infill stop at Elmhurst, but you're running at very low frequency, most likely, and the fares are premium. So why use the station and not to keep riding? This would not be the it would not be the E train. It would be the maybe here would be the E train, It'd be the R train or the M train. Why? Why is that? Now this also um, was a problem with Penn Station access, which is almost Intel, but not quite. Um, it's, uh, so right now, the commuter trains um, from New Haven, New Rochelle, all go to Grand Central, and not via the Amtrak route, which is uh, um, the Hellgate line goes like this um, to Penn Station. So Penn Station access, as the name suggests, gives the New Haven line access to Penn Station. This includes four infill stops in the Bronx, Co-op City, um, um, Parkchester, Hunts Point, I'm forgetting the fourth, and so I'm going to look at my crayon because Morris Park is the one that I'm missing. So Co-op City, Morris Park, Parkchester, Hunts Point, um, Palm Parkway is infill that I drew just for the better connection to the Fort Hunt buses um, going here. Um, and I think an old crayon of mine also had a stop here. Um, on the upgrade, and this is in the other. This is under Dharma Heights direction of the upgrade Astoria. This was studied and rejected. Um, this should be built, but why was it rejected? Well, first of all, they had some construction problems, but these um, it still can be built around. The problem is that they were assuming premium fares um, and very low frequency. And now, if you're making that assumption in Co-op City, which is um, Far from the subway, the subway that is close to the literal end of a local line, um, then yeah, maybe you can squeeze some ridership out of this, um, out of people going, coming from um, from co -op, from the actual co-op city, which is here, not here. Um, but if it's Astoria, why would people switch 
um, from the subway, which is that which goes like this, to a commuter train that only goes to Penn Station. Um, again, Sunnyside Junction is my thing; it does not exist. Um, why would they, why would they do that? Um, especially with premium fares. I mean, yeah, maybe people pay premium fare very far out, even though they probably don't. People, um, Wakefield here, it's a, it's an existing station. It's not NFL that I'm proposing. It's actual, it's an actual station that has very low ridership because even though here, Wakefield on the two is at the literal end of the line, uh, which has the most number of stations of any line in the system, I believe. Um, I believe it has more stops than the A train. Uh, and uh, I believe it's two and then the A. Um, so very tight stop spacing, and it's a very local line right up until it goes to Manhattan. Sure, in Manhattan, there's an express cycle line, but it's still a very slow line when you go all the way up to Wakefield. And even then, very little ridership at Wakefield, um, commuter rail, lots of ridership um, on the subway. And likewise, uh, Far Rockaway, same thing. Um, there is a train here, uh, the A train. Um, again, the A and the two, I believe, are the top two in number of stops. So um, this is, again, very far, not even that frequent, because some trains divert to um, uh, to Lefferts and Ellison Park. So it's every 15 minutes. But it's still more frequent than the LIRR, and it charges subway fares. So there's, again, very little LIRR ridership at Far Rockaway um, and more ridership um, subway Far Rockaway. So... Oh, oh, okay. Again, I don't follow like random orange man updates. Again, I follow things like the Muslim ban, um, or uh, the various justices appointed uh, by uh, by Trump, like uh, um, like like um, Kavanaugh and his uh, 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 like Kavanaugh and his. Uh, Immortal uh, quote: uh, "I like beer." And anyway, so the uh, so the point they're making is that it's useful to have info. And by the way, this is this crayon has a lot of info. Um, so remember how there was the Hollis thing? Here, there's Hollis, um, and also Merrick Boulevard, and a bunch of things here um, at important. Uh, bus connection points. So the, ideally, you want to put the infill where you can connect to a bus um, for people who are not walking distance to the line. Um, Woodhaven is something that... Again, I, I, Woodhaven used to exist, literally. Um, right here. Um, just so that people can just connect better and use the line for urban service. But to do it right, you need to get other things right. You need to get the frequency right. You need to get the fares right. You need to integrate with buses. And again, New York is not thinking of doing any of that, unfortunately. Boston and Philadelphia are, again, they're glancing in that direction, but there are problems. Um, like Ben in comments is mentioning the, uh, why would Kavanaugh not enjoy Sweden? Why would Kavanaugh not enjoy Sweden? Excuse me. And, like sexual assault is basically legal in Sweden, unless you're Muslim. Um, Sweden, um, Maybe it's no longer true, but it's certainly until like four years ago, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway had basically the lowest prosecution rates um, for sexual assault. Um, so I think something like 5% of reported sexual assault in these three countries led to conviction in the United States is in the teens. Um, the, like, whatever sexual assault there is there, and in Scandinavia is falsely blamed on immigration just because the immigrants are the only ones who are being regularly prosecuted. Uh, and uh, in fact, the, the, not the reported, the reported rates, the reported sexual assault rates in Sweden um, rose rapidly with immigration just because immigration happened to coincide with uh, changing the rape law so that it became, uh, so that they reported more things. But the survey rate, um, has been high for 25 years. That's not. I mean, I mean, there were no Syrian refugees, or almost no Syrian refugees in Sweden 25 years ago. Um. um sure, but um, conviction right. So in Sweden, the convic the reporting rates in Sweden are higher, but the conviction rates are terrible. Um, to the point that human rights groups 
complained about them that they're not prosecuting enough. And I think only about three or four years ago did they start taking this seriously. But I don't know to what extent they're prosecuting people for it as opposed to just prosecuting um, the least white people for this. So at any rate, yeah, what Kavanaugh did is even more illegal in Sweden than in the United States. Um, what do the only sound government start? Oh, you mean um, booze? There, are, I think there are American states that have um, something like government stores for alcohol. Again, don't ask me about where people say well, how to get alcohol. I'm not the correct person to ask. Yes, New York area buses mostly go to major hubs, but you want grid buses. Also, uh, Brooklyn and the Bronx are grids already. Um, and um, you want to, okay, yeah, this. this I remember it was some American said, I don't remember which one. Um, and um, the thing is, you want the grid. The streets are enough of a grid. You don't want to make the bus, to congest the buses in crowded um, centers, like the like city center, which would be Midtown, um, or downtown Brooklyn, or uh, Flushing in Jamaica. So as much as possible, I want to have a, um, to, to have an isotropic grid system and then for non-isotropic things use rail, use urban rail, um, which thankfully New York has, it's not crayon. Um, infill is not crayon. Infill is orders of magnitude cheaper than crayon. And um, frequency, I mean, yeah, it costs more money to run these trains, but um, the crew costs, the marginal crew costs are not going to be high because you're just going to get more efficient from running more off the frequency. Um, also, something that is not crayon, running driver-only trains as opposed to dri a driver and many conductors. Um, it's pretty useful. Uh, so, uh, and, and the fares, I mean, yeah, you're, gonna, um, you're going to not grab as much money per passenger, but you're just gonna get so much more ridership. Remember, the Berlin S-Bahn, I think has, I wanna say 450 million riders annually, pre-corona. 480 in 2018. I don't, I, I, it's possible all American commuter rail systems combined were this. Um, and it's not because the operating costs in Berlin are higher. Berlin has way fewer employees, for example, than the LIRR. The LIRR alone has a multiple of the headcount of workers that the Berlin has. So it's just an efficiency. So this is, again, it's on crayon. Um, yeah, um, transit, yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, buses, yeah, bus hubs are useful in like sufficiently low density suburbs that you don't really have a grid, you, um, especially if you have lower, if the density is lower to the point that um, the trains don't run every five minutes, they're on every, I don't know, 15 or 20 or 30, and then you should time the buses to make the trains. Um, something that's in Switzerland, they do even every 15 minutes, let alone every 50, no, 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 not 50, every 30. 50 is not half of an hour. There's no um, decimal hour. It was, this did not actually happen in the French Revolution. Um, I think they had plans for this, or um, 100 seconds to the minute, 100 minutes to the hour, 10 hours to the day, and then they didn't. Yes. And yes, exactly. Um, not one to two people on a commuter train, it's one person on a commuter train, and zero to one on a subway. Plan on zero, but one is okay for now. Um, yeah, there's something that Uday is talking about, about um, how to make maintenance more efficient that I don't fully understand. Um, Uday being this guy. His name is Uday Schultz. He scares me. Um, like crow picker. I think I mentioned this, I think, two videos ago, that they scare me with how much they know. Um, and anyway, so the issue, so the point is that, not not the Swedish trick, right, something else. Um, so, so the issue is that infill, again, very important, 
but it's important as part of a modernization plan. A modernization plan should include um, making the stations more useful to urban riders, and this means treating it as urban rail. So the point of infill is you make stops like maybe express, still urban rail. And you need to have the fears of urban rail, the, free, um, the frequency of urban rail, the integration with other urban transit of urban rail. Um, that's why you do infill. Um, this is why infill is important on lines that lack it, provided again, maybe, maybe you don't want exact infill um, if it's let's say, an express variant of a local subway nearby. Um, not that I'm not drawing any info here, because the four and five trains are crossed. Um, and yeah, they're very crowded, but removing some passengers from them that, um, that ride in the Bronx or from Harlem would also be useful. Um, but when you're not next to a subway line, yeah, you should just have more stops in the city. Um, and you're and in near city. And when I think the city, I don't even mean in city center. I mean in urban neighborhoods. Astoria, for the purposes of more stops in the city is the city. Um, so I'm going to end here and ask if people have any questions. None on, not on this topic? Okay. I will say that sometimes even very forward thinking plans don't look at um, infill. So, for example, Ben mentioned what's going on in Philadelphia. But um, in other American cities, there's the same problem. So, uh, Chicago has all these weird we're running slash airport slash high speed rail plans that um, use Metro Electric heavily um, as a modern line, things like Crossrail Chicago. Um, the network core. And they still don't have a lot of info on that trial electric. Um, so you talk about upgrading it to modern standards. One stand form. No, I just want to look at your uh, metra. No, they're saying green locomotives. There are no green. There are no locomotives um, being bought on modern commuter rail systems. Sometimes there are legacy ones that are being replaced with EMUs. Airport service because airport service is always overrated. And I don't mean, by always overrated, I don't mean it's always bad. I mean, everyone overrates it. Network core. I don't, want to, I don't want to tell Congress anything. I want to look at the map of, note that they're not providing a lot of information about where the, what a writer would actually be able to do with this. They're just telling people to tell Congress. Okay, so they're showing a few stops, but note that they're showing this long, long stop segment. Um, where is this? Okay, good. So note that they're, so they're showing those local stations with um, trains going millennium, um, uh, non millennium. Um, they're diverting from millennium uh, from museum slash McCormick Plaza, which is I guess millennium near millennium, then Burnham Lake front, and then direct 39th Street. Um, and if you know anything about Chicago, um, street numbers are, um, each street number is 100 meters, um, 16 to a mile. Um, so the museums would be, I guess, here because the idea is to go like this. Um, and then they're going direct from there to, I think this is 39th. Again, I'm, I'm not as familiar with Chicago as with the East Coast cities, but I can do a little bit of Google Earth tourism. Which first name is it? No, this is Pershing. This is 43rd. Okay. So is this 35th? Yeah. So they're going to, where, where did they say? 
39th, which I guess is just Pershing. And then um, 47th, this is Kenwood. And then they start having a lot of stops, but right here there aren't a lot of stops. Um, that's not deemed to be very important, unfortunately. Um, and this is something that does have pretty close stop spacing around here at Hyde Park and near Hyde Park. Um, whereas the other lines do the thing, this thing even more extremely that they barely stop within the city and then, or, or like the BNSF line barely stops within the city and then um, stops basically every mile or something outside the city. Um, anyway, uh, Warner, when should infill stations have overtaking platforms? Uh, it depends. Depends on how much service you want to run there. Depends on how much service you want to run through. Um, all of the American examples that I'm giving should not have special overtaking platforms because either they're on already four track main lines like, um, um, like the LIR main line or they should just have all the trains stop there and like, in, like the Eastern line. Um, none of, so the one place where I'm Squeamish about infill, which is the Providence line, is the place where um, you have you, where you have longer range trains on the same tracks. Um, so, so that this doesn't. So that is a consideration. It's just that in most cases, it's kind of a moot point. Like the main line, the the, the Philly main line, the PR one, is four track. Stop the main line. Ditto. And also, no intercity service. So it's so so in these examples, um, you should in the overtake platforms either already exist because the line has four tracks or shouldn't exist. Um, um, Caltrain is also another example of a really good modernization plan from Clem and Richard, Comtia and Richard and Eric, um, but they didn't touch the fares, so they didn't uh, and they didn't and, and they. So there are people who call for infill at the uh, Oakdale. Um, Richard does not think it's valuable. Um, and look, look at this. There's so this is Bayshore, and then it's not non-stop because there's a stop at 22nd, mostly for our first commuters. But there should be way more stops here. Way more local stops. Does Germany have conductors on regional trains? I believe so. Um, don't remember. When it was just riding, um, I, I definitely remember having seen conductors on regional trains around S Um The really long S-Bahn branches. I don't remember having seen a conductor when I rode the Ryan Car s but but um, I also don't remember not seeing one. Um, what about the question about Euro infill? Um, Wait, where's there a question about your info? You mean in you mean UK main lines? I don't know. Um, um, I don't know to what extent. So I don't know the situation in Britain outside London. In London, nothing in London has screamed at me this needs info. London has screamed at me things like this needs deinterlining, or they need to get their construction costs under control so that they can build more crossrail tunnels. But nothing that screams to me um, needs info. Oh, do I have info recommendation for Germany or Eastern Europe? That was the question. In okay, so again, in Germany, my knowledge as you move out of Berlin drops rapidly. So it's possible there. Are, yeah, in Eastern Europe, I know even less. Like I can't. Like I'm not gonna crayon. Prague for you, or Warsaw, or, or Budapest. Um, in Budapest, my crayon will likely involve defidestalization more than uh, um, what to do with the commuter trains. Um, just ask the mayor of Budapest what to do. Um, again, in, in Berlin, I don't see anything that screams this needs info. In Paris, there's a little bit, um, but again, very little. Um, Paris is actually pretty good at the stop spacing, but again, Berlin is the same. Yeah, Eastern Europe should. So, um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, like Warsaw has 
through tunnels, but I don't think the frequency through them is very good. Um, it's kind of weird because they do look up to Germany in many ways. Um, maybe not Poland, but the rest of the reason I mean, um, uh, in, in, in Czechia, they definitely do have a tact for intercity trains, just the commuter trains are not as modernized. Um, what about um, autonomy and um, what about adding infill and what? Yeah, the rest of the UK is crap sack, but I mean, the rest of the UK is crap sack is also a general tourism about everything in the UK. Um, the solution, I mean, in the same way that I was once asked about what uh, was my crayon for St. Louis, and I fired up crayon for New York um, and said something about um, TOD. Like, there's very high wage inequality between London and the rest of Britain, and the solution is not to do leveling up or to have, uh, um, okay, or, or to have, okay, um, Prince Charles talk about leveling up uh, in, in a speech from his throne that sounds like it was written by a secret Republican, and I don't mean an American Republican, I mean a Republican, a Republican in the British sense. Uh, um, so instead what they should be doing is targeting 100,000 annual housing units in Greater London. Um, and this means a gentleman will have to live on shelves and deal with this. Um, Charles does Charles does very little infill. Remember, Charles does uh, Charles objects to tall buildings, which means that anything involving actually building necessary office space in the city, um, as opposed to um, in random job sprawl locations. Uh, runs into intense um, opposition from him, and this is why they keep getting all these star attacks, is because they feel like they need to get a star attack in order to impress um, the planners to be allowed to build, and this drives up um, office tower construction costs. You really need to make sure you don't have a lot of jobs at all. Um, like, if jobs go from the city to Camden Town, or, or uh, London Bridge, or Waterloo, or Canary Wharf, even, or, or uh, or, or Ox Circus, okay, whatever, but if they're going to some random auto-oriented location near Heathrow, please stop. Um, so yeah, no, the Polish s bonds really need to get the frequency, right? Um, and again, this also is something that I've seen in Prague. I mean, the frequency is okay, but it's not the matter. It's very much not the matter. Um, okay, but it's going yeah, that's in like the Lee Valley, but the, the Lee Valley, first of all, just getting there is really difficult. What they should be doing is just connecting crossrail, like we're doing crossrail too and connecting it to, um, and connecting it to what's it called? Um, the, um, East Coast mainline system. Um, as opposed, so for people who don't know what is what the issue is, um, there's Crossrail. It just opened. I don't think Google is showing it, um, but there's plan for something called Crossrail Two, which is currently paused. The cancelled is to say paused for severe costs, um, which is north south or rather southwest northeast. Um, and the idea is to undulate through this area, I don't remember the exact route, and then um, go to Victoria. Uh, and then the core, and then the actually core useful segment is Victoria, Tottenham, Tottenham Court Road for connections to the, uh, to Crossrail, to Crossrail 1 and the, uh, and the Central Line, and the uh, Charing Cross half of the Northern. Then a station here for serving at one end, use and the other St. Pancras. And then what I think they should be doing is just connecting to the East Coast system, which is this one. Instead, what they're actually doing is meandering through here, through Islington, um, um, in order to hit the Lee Valley lines, these ones, just because this is supposed to be a good DOD opportunity, aka they think they can do TOD without people throwing... Do, do, I, I want to say without people throwing bricks, but it's British people, they don't throw bricks. They 
write sternly worded letters and for some reason they get listened to. Um, dear um, London development people, yeah, this is a good place for TOD. Do you know what a really good place for what an actually really good place for TOD is? Um, all those underfall West London uh, lines where they should be building lots and lots of mid and high rise housing um, right near every underground stop here. These are underfall. The fall, the um, the overcrowded direction is from the east. Um, so it's from the southeast, not from so it's not southwest, not west or northwest. Um, the Vic is very crowded going from the south, but um, what what's the name? How do you pronounce this? Like the the um, um, so it's not the underground. The uh, this is Walthamstow or something like that, where the Vic ends at the north. You know what I'm talking about, right? I, or, or am I attempting to? Yeah, it's this place, Walthamstow. Is that how it's pronounced, or do I need to stop pronouncing half the letters like Walthamstow or some shit? Um, because Walthamstow, that's an actually under full area. So, so look at the land use here. I was not intending to discuss the idea, but I guess I have to. Um, look at the land use here. Um, row houses. Fam one family. 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 And also one family. Uh, this is a line that runs a train into central London every minute 40 seconds at rush hour um, because it is severely overcrowded. Not from here. This, there isn't all that much ridership from here. The severe overcrowding is from the other direction. Um, um, people trying to hit from staff on, trying to hit the, um, trying to hit, um, um, trying, trying to hit um, the west end, and likewise, commuter rail people who get off at Victoria and then um, change here to get to the west end. So you want TOD. You generally, in general, if you want to do TOD on a very overcrowded subway line, you want to look at the less crowded direction of everyone. And so, POD here, please. I do not know whether people here have organized NIMBY groups. None of this matters. England is a unitary state. Um, I'm sure there are worse things. It's Britain. Like the, the, um, the only thing that works than British NIMBYism is American NIMBYism. Um, you want to complain about um, unsupportive land use? Or, or like inappropriately low density land use um, in a very transit rich area. Let's go to Brownstone and Brooklyn. Um, now this is not row houses. This is a little bit. This topology is a little bit dumpster, um, but still. Uh, go here and look at the brownstones, and ask yourself whether three story buildings, uh, like basement and then three habitable stories, uh, and yeah, maybe a little denser stuff on the corners is the land use that you want right on top of subway lines that are about 10 minutes from lower Manhattan and not especially crowded. The F is crowded. It, it, again, it's the less crowded direction of a very crowded line. The, the F is incredibly crowded from Queens, much less crowded from Brooklyn. Um, by the way, I'm getting off topic. So are there other questions about the installation and related issues? Give people like two more minutes to type, and then if there's nothing else, stop at 8:50. I definitely want to be done by nine. Is there any situation where removing stations makes sense? Yes. Um, some stations are just way too weak. Um, it depends also on whether you want to build a line that's mostly for longer distance ridership. Um, but um, in Boston, so it depends also on, on whether the removal of a stop is enough to let you save a train based on uh, 
based on the fact. Uh, at one point, I kept recommending. So, so this is also an example of a place that should have info on the, the north side. Um, so we're proposing a bunch on the way to Fetchburg, um, and on the way to uh, and on the way to Winchester and Lowell, we are not, or barely are, because um, the info that should have been done is all on the Green Line extension. Um, so um, at one point, I recommended exfilling Whitemere. So this is not exfil here, but this look at how close they are. This is a reasonable candidate for exfil if it lets you save a train. Um, Michoam, which I'm not depicting, uh, it is roughly the Route 128 stop. It is very little ridership, but that's mostly because of poor lines on the other side. I mean, this could be done. This could be this could be turned into something better. Um, in the RR plan for transit matters, we are recommending keeping it and investing in it to make it better, um, as opposed to Axel. But again, it's something that you could Axel. Um, so there are cases where it's useful. Um, Caltrain, for example, basically every Caltrain modernization plan includes permanently Axeling Atherton, which is already mostly Axel. I think it's only getting served on the weekends. It's just way too low density. Um, very low ridership. Um, what about insulin moral? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, have we talked about DC? Not right now because um, so in DC, the thing is that in DC, especially on the Maryland side. Um, uh, a lot of the places that should have infill instead are, have the red line next to them. Somehow, um, some of the red line connects uh, to both. Somehow, the red line goes from the uh, Brunswick line to the Brunswick line. Um, but certainly, the Brunswick line is just so close to the red line, it doesn't really need the infill. Um, Camden's, I think, close enough to the green, it should not have infill. Penn. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and on the Virginia side, again, it's, the, it's so close to the yellow line that um, only really important stops should maybe be infilled. Um, like, it's not like it's, again, as I said, it's okay to be an express variant of a subway line. The reason you might want, I mean, you, you want to make the service useful for urban riders, but... Um, it's okay to be to be an express line right next to an or to, right next to an urban line, um, provided that you serve the major nodes. So, so note that, for example, I'm not constantly yelling about infill on port on the Port Washington branch because it's okay to be an express seven, provided service to and beyond to to a, to an immediately beyond flushing is very good. Um, so in DC, yeah, uh, DC, I don't see it as a good infill place. It, it, Good question, but again, I don't think it's good for infill, just because of how the infill exists and is called the Washington matter. If that makes sense. Um, does that answer your question? Awesome. Um, are there other questions?
Um, if there are no more questions, I'm, I'm going to wait maybe one more minute, and then if not, then thank you for sticking for, for sticking with the stream. Thank you for watching. Thank you for excellent questions. Thank you for correcting me when I'm uncertain about things like the Philly uh, modernization plan for SEPTA. Thank you, Ben. And also thank you, Huli, for the examples from um, the Rhineland, from like Norway and that's one. And so thank you all for watching, and I will see you again uh, in a week with another video topic.